the record button so I don't forget to do so later. Okay. And I will pull up the Canvas page and specifically the syllabus. Okay. And now, right, home. And all right, I should probably pull up our textbook as well so I can introduce you to that. Okay, so see, I know class is technically starting, but we'll give it just a bit longer for people coming in. Uh, participants, there we go. 100, 102, 104. Okay, how's everybody doing today, by the way? Might as well make small talk while we're here. I'm chilling. Just got my booster. Cool. That's good. By the way, you should get boosted. It's very it. It is the science. That's what the science basically suggests that it's it makes it a lot more effective. Um, the death rates uh show that for vulnerable populations. Um. So. Um, actually, and I actually handled the, the actually the the booster was like no problem whatsoever. It was just a matter of um, of some arm pain. That was it. You know, the, I, I had like fever symptoms on the second shot, but third shot, no problems. So um, let me send a message to my wife to let her know that the dog wants to go out. Very inconvenient timing. Sorry, good luck. Don't freeze. Everybody warm, by the way? I hope everybody's nice and warm because uh, they're okay. We're at 120, it's 202. Let's go ahead and get this started. So I am Professor Rosen. Um, I, am, I am recording this lecture um, just, and I'll be recording every lecture and I'm pasting them and posting them later. Um, this lecture, I'm going to basically go over how the class works um, and uh, how it may change as conditions improve or don't improve, right? Um, I've, um, this class is, um, is open to everybody. Uh, so long as you have some, I think, basic math prerequisites, you are able to take this course. We don't assume any programming knowledge whatsoever. Um, but possibly the first thing and the most important thing I have to say is that not everybody here is a complete novice. Uh, some people are just self-taught and this is the first time they formally enrolled in a program. So that's gonna seem like they know everything. In fact, there's gonna be a number of people who seem like they know everything and that's gonna create a false impression that you should know everything. This is false, okay? Um, the only person whose progress you can compare yourself with is your own in this class, okay? Um, so the, so just, you know, don't feel like you don't belong here just because you have people who, um, already know a bunch of stuff. Um, I was lucky enough that I took a programming class in high school and basically have been living with computers since I was four. So, um, that helps, uh, some people, they, they may be in college and this may be their first computer that they actually own as their own. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's go ahead and share screen, move this here. So share screen and we'll do just this page. All right, so this is our Canvas webpage. If you haven't checked it out, you should. This page, this front page, most important page there um, because you can get everywhere else from there. Uh, a couple things to note. Uh, look at that beautiful picture of me and all my TAs, okay? 
and my happy feet, my dog, who will act as your grader through this semester. Um, the uh, um, you can find the various links to our Zoom meetings uh, below the appropriate TA or via me, as well as our email addresses. Um, also worth noting is that we do have a Discord. Uh, we have a Discord chat. Um, so please feel free to uh, join in. Um, this is for all my classes, both 1060, both 1051 and 2168. So you'll have students there, other students there, as well as me who, uh, you know, you can shoot off quick, quick questions to and get quick responses. It's, it's very convenient. I just hopped on uh, an hour ago to one of the study rooms I've uh, set up to help somebody with the code. Um, it's good for quick things like that. Um, all right. Also, textbook information is here. The textbook is free and it's online. Uh, use the, uh, we'll, we'll go over how to sign up for it in a second, but again, it's free. Signing up meaning putting in your username and your password and email. Um, so uh, there are a grand total of six sections for this class, meaning that you have, meaning that you're in one of these six sections, one, seven, two, six, three, or four. Sections one and two are on Monday and everybody else is on Friday. So just keep that in mind. Um, let's see, other thing, anywhere, any of the lecture recordings, the in-person lecture recordings can be accessed by clicking here, this lecture recording button. Okay, that, and I will update this page with a new playlist and you'll be able to see the previous semesters. Okay. Um, so with that, we can go into the syllabus to explain uh, kind of case by case how this class is run. Okay, um, so we all know that the, that COVID-19 has basically means that we cannot meet in person right now. Hopefully within, two, uh, you know, after the first two weeks of school, starting week three, we can meet in person again. But if we have to do it online, so be it. I will do this online and I can do it online and I have done it online. Um, this is a flipped class. Uh, that is the best way I found to do it, which means that I will have a uh, lecture material slash textbook materials. So the textbook has basically all the content that you need uh, for the most part. Um, and what the textbook doesn't have, I do videos of. I also have videos uh, to complement the textbook and go through the same material that the textbook does. Um, the idea here is that we will spend time in class working on, you know, live coding projects with the textbook and the videos there to help you learn the concepts. Um, so our labs will be in person. Um, the links can be found on the front page of Canvas, but I've also got them hot linked here. Um, so there are other, um, so there are, I've got my assignments, um, Divided, by the way, that's this is the next couple of points. I've got my assignments divided into about uh, six different sections: solo exercises, classroom exercises, demoed lab assignments, quizzes, final project, final exam. So, solo exercises, I'll go into those. Same with classroom. The demoed lab assignments, the ones that that are the big ones you work on, kind of a weekly basis. Um, they are they are the way you turn those in is a two part process. You submit your homework by uploading the appropriate uh, files to Canvas. Homework that is late is based on the day it's submitted, not when it's demoed. So you submit it when you're done with it, and then you make office hours or you uh, with me or the TA, or you go to the TA during lab, or you reach out to me after lecture, and you can demo your homework. Okay? That's how you get a grade. You have to demo it. You have to show that it works. Um, uh, and we'll typically, we may ask you a question or two about it uh, or to explain something about it as, as it goes on, but this is just to help us uh, make sure that you understand the code. Um, uttering, there's it, one of the only ways to instantly fail the course is to utter this phrase. I did not know we needed to demo our assignments to receive credit. If you say that after your first exam or, well, we didn't have any, we don't have exams right now, but if you utter that like after week five, yeah, that's going to be an instant F because you didn't read the first page of the syllabus. And, and you need to read that syllabus. Um, 
instructions to sign up for the textbook over here. So when you sign up for the textbook, use your TU email as your sign up email. So your TU letter number, 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 number at temple.edu and use your name as displayed on Canvas. One of those two things has to be true, either using your email or the name as that matches your name on Canvas. Because I've got this wonderful script that uh, that pulls all the stuff from our textbook website and merges it with our Canvas website. But in order to merge it with the right person, it needs either your name to match or your email address to match. Make sense? Otherwise, it becomes like, hey, why am I getting all zeros? I know I did all the work. And I'm like, oh, let me check. Oh, we don't have a match. So now I have to go in and do that manually, which is a bit of a pain. Um, when signing up for office hours, I'll explain office hours. Uh, ensure that you sign up with the person you want. And uh, finally, don't cheat in this class. I will catch you. The only thing easier than cheating in computer science is detecting cheating in computer science. Uh, for last year, I had 48 charges out of the about 400 students I taught. Don't do it. Yes, not wearing a mask to lab or lecture will result in defenestration. Does anyone here know what that term is? What is defenestration? Yes. Um, I looked it up. I think it's getting thrown out of a window. Yes, it is the act of throwing somebody out of a window. Unfortunately, I can't actually do that. So um, instead, if you if if we have somebody being um, not good about their mask and not wearing a mask, um, I will remind you. I will remind you that if you do not put on the mask, I'll cancel the entire lecture, and then I will cancel the entire lecture and or the lab and just simply and just simply make that up somehow. Um, and then I'll apply sanctions to the student in question, which shouldn't be hard because I'll take a picture and you aren't wearing a mask, so that will make it easy to identify. So, um, yeah, don't, uh, don't, uh, just don't play around about that. It's serious. Okay. Um, all right. We, we were supposed to put this in. So, course detail. So, right. Um, so this is a four hour course. Um, the best, while a lot of people like, we, we put in math prerequisites and that kind of stuff for computer science classes in general. The most, uh, the most, the course this is similar to is um, music, right? Um, the only way you can get good at music is by practicing because it's a skill. Same with computer science and um, programming specifically. Uh, you need to practice, which is why I have the textbook exercises, the short, um, not heavy, you know, they're not, how to say, high, not high stakes exercises. So to succeed, you need about eight to 12 hours of coursework each week about outside of lecture. That, that's what a four hour credit means. It means for every credit hour, you're expected to do somewhere between two and four hours of work outside of, outside of class. So keep that in mind. Um, if you fall behind, it becomes the. If you fall more than a week behind, it becomes much more difficult to catch up. That's about the kind of limit. Uh, you can do it; it's just hard. Uh, time and place. Congratulations, you found it. We're on Zoom for right now. Labs. Um, that's where you'll you'll be. Um, some labs occupy the same exact space as the other labs. Okay, you're expected to know how to use a computer. Um, you, uh, a reliable laptop is strongly recommended because laptops are easy to get around. If you cannot afford a laptop or you do not have a laptop, uh, please let me know. I will work with you to find something within your budget. Okay, uh, there will be something. I even if it even if it's a uh, even if it's a crazy Raspberry Pi based solution, I will figure something out. Um. So resources and text. Um, we are working off of a free textbook because I hate textbooks and the way the textbook industry works. Um, I don't see why you need to pay yet another hundred dollars to take my class. So here you go. If you need a hard copy for some reason, uh, so like you need you need to be able to read stuff offline. Here are two great resources. Uh, both also are free, and the printed copy is twenty to thirty bucks. Uh, which is automate the boring stuff and uh, think Python, how to think like a computer scientist. This one is targeted to non-programmers who want to learn a bunch of programming to make their uh, jobs a lot, a lot more efficient. And this one's targeted for people who want to learn computer science. So 
different kind of audiences. Also, Python has their own tutorials, which is cool. Office hours, great. So office hours will all be conducted online, even if we're on, in, back in person. Um, my office hours might be subject to change, but uh, the way you find, find them is you click here to, this, to go to this booking page or over here, um, which will uh, br which will pull up this. You can sl you select what you need in this case, and then which is office hours for this or general advice, and then select uh, who you want to meet with. Um, if it says anyone, you'll want to check your email as to who you've scheduled with. Um, so, and then you select the time and it'll reserve a 15 minute sl time slot for you. Um, these are not the only hours I can meet. Uh, if you cannot make any of the hours that we have listed for me or any of the TAs, just send me an email and we'll work out a mutual time. These are just simply the uh, convenient times for me, which are between 11 and one on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, if you need to meet with me another time, again, just send me an email. I can meet with, I can meet with you pretty uh, pretty late at pretty late hours on my end. So no worries there. Um, excuse me one second. I, I have a, I have to handle something. Sorry, the dog wanted to really go out and apparently my wife did not get the message that the dog needed to go out. So, okay. Fun times from teaching from home, right? Um, so let's see, I was here. So office hours, right? Just simply make a, an appointment. Um, this automated system works really well for us. So that's why we use it. Um, and it will also send you reminders if you put in your email address correctly. So um, your attendance is, is expected for your lab and your lecture. If for some reason you don't show up, just let us know, right? Um, it's good to show up because that's how you get more out of the class. But like if stuff is going on, like uh, you have to cover for somebody, or your car broke down or you're sick, totally understand, right? Um, attendance will not like Im directly impact your grade. There is no attendance grade, right? We do in-class exercises, but uh, as you'll see, the due dates for that are soft. So if you miss it, just watch the recorded lecture and make it up on your own time. Um, in general, and this is true for, this is even true beforehand. If you're, if you are or suspect you are sick, do not come to class. Okay, just let me know. That includes for exam dates. Just let me know. We'll make up whatever you have to do. Similarly, for mental health, it's not like there's anything going on that would affect your mental health in a negative manner, right? Like certainly this is not a st extremely stressful time uh, and, and with increased chaos and, and instability. So uh, if you are experiencing extreme, you know, stress, worry, or just getting uh, hella depressed, I guess. Um, just reach out to me. If nothing else, I can be a pair of sympathetic ears. Do so at any hour. I'll respond as soon as I can. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I can at least hear. And more importantly, the sooner you let me know about something, the sooner I can come up with accommodations for you, uh, a, a different schedule for turning stuff in, or options for incompletes. Okay. The sooner we figure that stuff out, the better. Uh, it is less useful when it's a week out from the end of the semester, unless what unless your life implodes like at the end of the semester. That is less useful. If you've got an if you've got an issue and it starts affecting you in the middle of the semester, 
let me know in the middle of semester, not the end of semester. If your life kind of implodes for some reason at the end of the semester, let me know and we can work out what we need to do for an incomplete contract. Okay. Um, if you have a disability, contact ERS I will, um, and we will work on re making reasonable accommodations. I have yet to find any accommodation um, that is unreasonable, so no worries there. Recordings, I record your, my lecture. You can record it too, but if you do record it, you got to let me know because this is uh, in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is a two-party two consent state, which means it's illegal to record other people without their knowledge. So grading, I tweaked this a bit. These, these grade weights will always be up to, will always be up to date in, in Canvas. Um, we have six separate exercises. So we have three exercises and we have quizzes, the final project and the final exam. So let's go, get into that. So um, we've got, and yes, I did tweak these. I just didn't uh, update the syllabus because it's always difficult to do that one place. What I tweaked is that the solo exercises went down from 5% to, from 10% to 5%, and then the demoed lab assignments went up to 30%. So, um, so this is 5%. These are the exercises in the textbook. Um, they are short, targeted, and they are intended to cause little pain. If you find that they are causing pain, send me an email because some, they might be broken. Uh, they have an auto grade feature. Sometimes the but sometimes the professor who contributed the problem, because this is a community-based textbook, is working off of different assumptions or whatnot. So if it's causing you pain and, and anxiety, pain, anxiety, or just general grumpiness, just let me know. Worst case scenario, I'll just remove it. You know, it's it's not it's so these are short targeted and they're just meant to keep you on tap on track. Solo exercises, by the way, include textbook readings. You get credit for reading the textbook. Okay. Um, the due dates uh, for this are soft, meaning that uh, they, these things will have a listed due date. Let me go into my account and show you, right? You'll see that they have due dates here. These due dates are soft. You want to have them done by this time to keep up with the material. If for some reason you don't get it in by that time, when you do get it in, you'll get graded for it at no late penalty. If you do, I will accept any of this work up through the last day of, the, of class before the finals. So if you fall behind, this is one of those things you can do. And it's 5% of your grade. So that's five free points, essentially. Uh, same thing for classroom exercises. These are the exercises we'll do either on, from the textbook in class, because the, cl the reason, part of the reason I love this textbook is that it's got this huge stack of big projects here that we can do in class. Um, and there, but anything we do in class together, that's a classroom exercise. That's also 5%. And again, those are soft due dates. I want you to do them by the time, you know, in the class we're doing, but if you miss the class and have to make it up later, sure, you'll get full credit. Okay. And typically these are graded based off of participation, meaning did you turn something in, even if it's broken? Okay. Um, so those are, so these these are pretty soft deadlines, pretty good. Lab assignments. These are this is our what's most analogous to homework in your other classes. You should get one a week. Some of them, like lab four, you'll have two weeks to work on. Um, they are introduced and started in your lab periods um, or the lecture. They're super that introduction is supervised by me or the TA. Um, I highly encourage you getting help from your fellow students. And most importantly for these lab assignments, which remember are 30% of your grade, you need to demo them to get your credit. Uh, these due dates are firm, you know, soft versus firm. Late assignments will be accepted at five points per day with a maximum penalty of 50 points. So you turn in a day late, you do it all, 95 out of 100, no problem. Um, and it's And when you get your grade is, so what you get is based off of when you turn it in. So if you turn it in and on, on, Tuesday, on Tuesday, then demo it on Thursday, no problem. Uh, that's, that's not late because you demoed it two days later. Uh, you have two weeks, you have up to two weeks after the due date to demo your lab. Otherwise it's a zero. Um, this is 
So everything I just said there, because of COVID is malleable, okay? And now let me explain. If you're running into, if you need an extension, just send me an email, okay? And I will grant you accept, uh, I can grant extensions based on the reasoning for it, um, right? Because like illness or whatever, I'll give you an extension. No, no, you know, it's fairly straightforward with that. If again, for illness, you couldn't make it within the two weeks to demo your lab, again, let me know. Um, the reason that I have this caveat in here is because I, I had a number of students who would wait until the end of the semester to demo all their assignments. Hence why I also have that, do not say that the, the, I didn't know we had to demo assignments because inevitably because they demoed it late, later, that means that meant they weren't going to labs because we remind you in lab, you have to demo that, which means they didn't get help with anything they got stuck on, which meant that they inevitably had tons of bugs in them, which meant they couldn't get credit for it. So they show, would show me like five, seven assignments that they had done and all of them had a significant bug in them that, that I just couldn't give them credit for. Um, to turn in your assignment, you submit it to Canvas, and then again, you demo it to the TA. Um, so it is important, again, it's important to let me know if you're struggling to complete, to complete it, um, because people, especially freshmen, are reluctant to say, oh God, I need help, because it, they, they worry that I might think you're, you're, you're not smart or something. That's not the case, I need to know, so because I might have unrealistic expectations of due dates. Um, and so, or, you know, there might be a lot of stuff. What does de it mean demoing exactly? It means you show me your, it means you demonstrate it to me. You show me that your program works. You explain pieces of your source code, nid, and answer questions to, to uh, some questions. Like what does changing this variable do? What does changing this number to do? Demo, uh, demoing can be done after class, during my office hours, the TA's office hours, or during lab. And if none of this time work for you, send me an email and we'll figure something out. Um, the first lab to demo that one, which is essentially print out a biography, that's just to show that, hey, you've, the reason we have you demo that is just okay to make sure it's working, making sure that you can program and that you have a programming environment set up. That is the context of the first lab, making sure that uh, Python is installed on your computer all right, so final project. So around, um, around the last month of our course, uh, we transition this course from being much more, from being your standard freshman lectures to something that actually resembles what, will, what senior design classes more look like, where basically the last semester, the last week will be, you're, you're gonna stop getting homework essentially. You'll get a big project. Um, to work on. Um, that is worth 10% of your grade. Now that sounds scary, uh, but this is um, this basic, but we'll guide you through it. The idea here is to basically say, okay, we've learned, we've taught you how to swim. And now I'd like to see what happens when I throw you into the deep end of the pool. Um, you get to choose your own topic. We approve it, but you get to choose it. It can be a game. Games are very popular. And we'll talk about this in more detail. But what we're interested in is the journey and not the destination. I'll, um, one of the goals for this semester is to have a much more, uh, much more well-established rubric for this. But um, what, if, you make, if, if, if your game keeps me amused for a, for a minute, that's an A. That is, that, is, that is essentially what my rubric has been if you were doing a game. If it, if it amuses me for a minute or more, you get an A on, on your final project. So it's not really, we'll have more well-established stuff and, and I'm very easy to amuse. Um, your final project is optionally a group project. You can have up to three people in a group. You can also do it solo. Um, that's up to you. Um, it will be four parts, brainstorming uh, and, getting, and getting to know GitHub, the proposal, a progress report and a final project submission. Uh, you have to, we, this is, so we want, we want you to put this on GitHub, which will teach you how to, will, as part of this, we'll teach you how to do it. And, uh, furthermore, if we get to this point, the progress report, and you haven't done this yet, right? So this is about, 
this will be due about like a month before the end of the semester. And this will be due about two weeks before the end of the semester, okay? If we get to this point and you haven't done this, you're not gonna be able to catch up. You haven't done the appropriate, so, so that will just give you a, a zero on that. Uh, the due date for the final project is hard. Um, it, it will be due on the very last day of the semester. Uh, it will not be altered without prior approval, without some kind of accommodation or a sudden and documented emergency or event. Um, there is a late pop, pop penalty. You can turn it in late with a tenth of a point permanent late, so six points after. An, so if you turn it an hour late, it'll be six points off. Okay, that's not to scare you too much. But again, we're interested in the journey, not the destination. If you are overambitious and turn in something that's not fully working, but you're like, I have this piece, it works. This piece didn't, but I learned a lot. Here's what I learned. I learned X, Y, and Z, but to do better, I need to know A, B, and C. I consider that a good outcome for a freshman level course. A very good outcome. Definitely B worthy. Okay. We're interested in the journey, not the destination. How much did you learn? Okay, it's a learning experience, not a tech startup. Um, also, for those of you who are seniors and just taking this class to learn, uh, guess what? You can double dip. Anybody can double dip, meaning that uh, you are allowed and encouraged to do the same final project in this course and another course you are currently taking. The only thing you have to do is you have to let me know and let the other professor know that and get appro their approval that you're double dipping. Okay. That way, and this is important to see for, you know, for seniors, you may want to do a coding project for their senior design kind of thing. Okay. Or say you're in music and you're trying to create a musical performance and maybe you're going to think, oh, algorithmic composition. That sounds fun. Okay. Uh, quiz and exams. This is the part that is most subject to change but based on whether we're in person or not. As it stands right now, if we, uh, which is the way it's currently written, if we are online, you're going to be dealing with unproctored but timed quizzes, meaning that the quiz has a timer and you'll have a time limit to complete the quiz, uh, com uh, the quiz by and a due date to complete the quiz by. So essentially, uh, so long as we're virtual, it will be take home quizzes. Make sense? And I will go into more detail about them. Um, if we are in person, you will probably also get intermittent paper quizzes. Now, the reason we do paper is because if it's electronic, you're allowed to use all your re programming resources and you can test your code. But, you know, that kind of makes it harder for me to ask very useful freshman questions like, what does this code do? Like, what is the output of this code when I run it? What, you know, is it five, six, seven, or eight? Because if you've got a computer in front of you, you can just plug it into your computer and get the answer. So it's less useful, uh, so that's less useful. Um, so if we're in person, expect some simple paper quizzes. And by paper, I mean like 15 minutes. Uh, I prefer to do, um, my preference for, for a freshman level class is multiple quizzes. Um, and once we're back in person, those quiz, in-person quizzes will be much lower, will be lower stakes. Um, again, this is all subject to change. For right now, your quizzes will be uh, basically take-home quizzes because otherwise proctoring them becomes a nightmare and it be, will consume too much class, too much useful class time. Um, so the quizzes will have a listed, they will be found on RuneStone for the most part. Um, under your assignments, they'll be linked in our Canvas modules. I'll show you where to find them as they crop up, okay? Um, and they'll just have a due date. You'll want to have them done by that due date. Um, they have a late penalty. So if you need to take extra time, it's the same late penalty for that final project. That late penalty for the final project is harsh there, but it's actually really nice for your quizzes, which is that it's a tenth of a point off every minute late. So if you take an extra hour to do a quiz, guess what? You only lost six point, uh, lost six percent of your grade. So uh, if you need the extra time, it's there. If you have a DRS. Accommodation, by the way, forget everything set up. I said about the late stuff. We'll figure that out uh, for you. Final exams. Uh, we have one big final exam. Um, I typically ask only like three questions on the final exam, uh, three big questions. So that are broken up into multiple parts. Um, we'll talk about that later. 
Uh, finally, not all points are equal. Just because like an assignment is worth 10 points and a quiz is worth 10 points, those are different point categories. You know, so, uh, so just keep that in mind as you're taking it, right? Your assignment points stay with assignment points. Your exam points stay with your exam points. Um, and then you have a weighted average. So finally, I have to say this because um, again, I had a lot of cheaters last semester um, and I submitted a lot of academic charges. It is very easy for me to catch you. Um, the later in the semester it is actually, the easier it becomes for me to catch you. Um, so I try to be very reasonable about, well about like um, academic honesty. Uh, I believe that the best way to learn this material is to teach it to other people. Um, the essence, to sum it up, so be sure to read this section in full. The idea here is that anything that's not a group assignment, that has to be your own work. Uh, you're allowed to collaborate, ask questions, but you're not allowed to have other people do the work for you. The general rule is when you're asking for help, you can show your code to other people and say, hey, this is not working. Why is it not working? But you're not allowed to say, hey, here's my answer if you need help to figure it out in general. Here are basically different examples. Um, if you're having trouble completing an assignment, send me an email. I won't think you're stupid. I won't think you're dumb. I won't think less of you. I will recognize because this semester and the past couple of semesters have been total and utter chaos for everybody's personal lives, right? I am not going to think negatively of you if you need help. Okay, I will sit down with you and I will walk and I will lead you towards that, that uh, path to a solution that you need. Do not go to Chegg unless you want to fail the course and receive an academic misconduct charge on top of it. Because uh, not only are the answers on Chegg easily identifiable by, identifiable by me and easy for me to find or any other related website, they also tend to be wrong. All right, so what are reasonable things? Um, communicating with the classmates about assignments or to understand the material better. Uh, helping, looking at somebody else's code and saying, aha, you've got a bug there. Perfectly good. Uh, showing your code to somebody else saying, help me, help me. Uh, if you do that, I would like it if you cite that work in a comment and we'll go on about how to do that. Comments are pieces of code that humans can read, but the computer can't. They're like notes and stuff that you put in your code. Um, typically we use comment, the most, the most common use of comment in, in a freshman class is to put your name on your work. Um, so, so if you got help from Alice, just wrote that you got help from Alice. Um, getting a few lines of code online from like Stack Overflow or something, provided that that's not like the full solution to a problem, uh, that's useful, that's good. It's very common. Just be sure to cite it because this is an academic this is an academic setting, so you need to cite your resources. Uh, so, an example: if you need to figure out how to print out the contents of a dictionary in numerical order, a dictionary not being a word dictionary, but a a, a data structure we'll learn about later, and you find the answer on Stack Overflow, and that's not a question on a lab; that's just part of a bigger assignment that you're doing. You know. Copying the three lines that it takes and, the, and citing that, that's perfectly okay. Sharing a few lines of your code online saying, hey, Stack Overflow, I need some help. That's perfectly okay. Uh, finding something, something online, so long as they're not, you know, like the full solutions to my assignments, that's also okay. Doing solutions on a whiteboard. You know, if you write down your solutions, but it's not in code, it's like pseudocode, the kind of idea steps, that's perfectly okay. Working with and even paying a tutor, so long as they're not doing your work for you, awesome. What is not reasonable? Going, how do I so solve, uh, how do I do the pig game? And finding the answer on, on online and finding that, or finding a, uh, an assignment that somebody else had done, th done that uh, before. Uh, Asking somebody to see to see their code, saying, "Hey, can I see how you did it? I'm having trouble." Uh, no, ask, "Hey, can you take a look at what I'm doing? I am having trouble." Okay. 
failing to cite, as with comments, the origins of codes or techniques that you discover. Because again, this is an academic thing. You don't want to plagiarize, which means mi misrepresent somebody else's work as your own. So this is cheating. This is plagiarism. Copying and pasting code on a site you find online, that's pretty easy to identify. Finding code online that addresses a question on the exam and you don't cite it violates the policy. And blindly copying and pasting code will violate the policy and make me angry because if you do that, you have a that's happened last spring where students thought they were answering, they cheated on the exam and they cheat and the answer they got was an answer to a different question. They were simulating a game and they got a different version of the game. Did not work. Um, so searching or outright soliciting uh, the exam uh, the exam solutions or assignment uh, solutions to assignment. Again, looking up that answer to Chegg, I'm going to keep repeating it here. Uh, if you find my questions on a source like Chegg, just ignore it. And finally, I've had students last semester say that they uh, look up how other people do the problem. So they look up the solutions to figure out how to do it themselves. That's just cheating with extra steps. If you're having trouble doing that, send me an email. Okay. Uh, again, and finally, like, you know, grabbing your code from somebody else, changing a few variable names, putting your name on top of it, essentially doing the equivalent of, of, of taking your English paper and running it through a thesaurus. Um, don't do that. Again, it's even it's easier in my class to do that. Um, if you, I put in a regret clause now. If you made a vi so two things first off. If you're in doubt, a you should probably shouldn't do it, and b send me an email. I will be honest with you and tell you what you should and shouldn't do. Okay. Um, and if you do something that you know is wrong, I will catch you eventually. Send me an email within 72 hours. Um, and there will not be an academic mis a misconduct charge. Uh, after the 72 hours have passed, I will eventually reach out to you once I find, once I discover it, and I will discover it. Um, okay, that's not to scare you. Again, it's just that I had to deal with 47 uh, students worth of paperwork last semester. That's a lot, not last, last year. So if I can just stop you from doing it here, the temptation is much higher because we're online. I expect this to drop once we're offline again, and in person. So textbook, let's go to the textbook for a second. Okay, to find the textbook, click here and use the link to sign up. It is roomstone.academy. Um, let me log out for a second. What you're gonna wanna do to sign up is that you'll want to hit sign up over here and register, okay, for the course. And you can do this, you don't have to do this now, you can do this after class. Create your own username, that's fine. First name and last name, these should be what's on Canvas and your email should be your TU email. Like mine is tug85861 at temple.edu. Either this should match or your first name and last name should match. Don't use an alias here. Your password, it, it should be a password, you know? <laughs> Um, I, if you forget your password, I can reset it for you. Um, now, the last thing over here is that you'll want to sign up for the course, which is Spring 2022 Rosen. It's also in the syllabus as well as here. Spring 2022 Rosen. That allows me to know that you're taking my course and that allows me to actually grade your work. Okay. Once you've signed up for that and you'll log in, you'll have this thing. I have a lot of courses. You'll just cl click Spring 2022 Rosen and you'll have access to the textbook. Again, it's completely free. It might ask you for a donation. That's up to you. Um, the suggested amount is 10 bucks um, to help with their server costs. Uh, and then we've got this large textbook over here with all the chapters and stuff. We'll be working on chapter one this week and chapter two. And then for to find your assignments over here, you just Click right here on the person icon and hit assignments. Also, all your assignments can be found, all the assignments for the textbook, the solo exercises, right? If you go on to any of the module overviews, I'll tell you, hey, you got readings and stuff. These will link to that page as well. Again, these deadlines are soft. If you need extensions, 
or you feel like you're being overworked, let me know because I might have unrealistic expectations. But the only way I'll know that I have unrealistic expectations is for you to let me know. Okay. Um, because the classic way for a professor to figure out uh, what the right the the right amount of work is to keep piling on work until they until students scream for mercy and then back off. Not really a great way to do it, but certainly gives us definitive answers. Um, so, but this textbook is a great resource. It's free, and one of the things I love about it is that you've got a scratch pad right here. If you can't use Python for some reason on your computer, you can you you can write it over here. You, it's a full Python console. I can do print hello, which is the first bit of basic code we'll learn in lab. Just print out the hello statement. It's awesome. Don't worry if you didn't get, get any of that. That's fine. Um, because uh, again, we're not going to really start any kind of coding on until Thursday when we'll do this first project, a preview of the end goal, which requires no pro programming experience. The only thing it requires is can you read and can you hit a button? Okay, it's more gonna show you what this textbook is capable of and what you'll be capable of at the end of the semester. Okay, now with that, I need to clear up some misconceptions, but the first thing we're gonna do is just write, how do I know what I'm doing? Go to modules, start here to learn about the course, meet, uh, meet the professor to learn about me and my teaching statement. And then the overviews tell you what we're gonna be doing the week, during this week. Um, I have the linked videos in a separate page for this one, but in most weeks I have them in everything in the overview saying, hey, here's the videos and the respective readings that encompass the videos. The videos and the reading kind of go together. I cover the same stuff as the textbook. So, but some people it's easier for them to do the videos and some people it's easier to do the textbook. Just depends uh, on the person. So, um, all right. So the first thing we need to do is clear up some misconceptions about computer science, um, which is where I'll start. So first thing I'll do is I need to go to C drive. I need to go to documents. Don't worry, this will pop up in my window. Um, uh, documents, GitHub, classroom, nope, teaching, and ITP. And lecture1.pdf, right. Oh, which opened up an edge because of course it does. Open with Firefox, please, there we go. All right, so computer science first off is, uh, so this is a computer science course and it is a programming course. Those two things are kind of distinct. Um, typically I would ask for a show of hands about who's got experience. A lot of people do, but honestly that's very alienating. So I'm not gonna ask. Um, computer science is, no more about computers and astronomy is about telescopes. It's a terrible name. Biology about microscopes. Chemistry is about beakers and test tubes. We don't, computer science is like calling astronomy uh, telescope science is what they're saying. Um, computer science is not the study of computers, um, which is kind of what it implies by calling it computer science. Um, in other countries, this is uh, a computer science degree is often referred to as informatics. Um, it is not programming, although it's understandable that you might have that misconception because I had that misconception and everybody has that mental conception of computer science is programming. Um, it isn't also fully about learning programming languages. Pro uh, the computer science kind of began before programming languages, formal programming languages were a thing. And honestly, once you learn your first programming language, which will take a while, it's not too hard to pick them up. In fact, uh, 1051 um, and 1057, the next class you take after this is 1068, which uh, is in Java. Neither 1051 nor 1057 do Java. Um, so it's fairly, so the idea here is once you learn one, the concepts are pretty easily to map, easy to map to another. I can, I'm comfortable about picking up a new language and being pretty fluent in it in about two weeks. Programming language uh, takes a lot longer for the written ones. <laughs> um, we don't study like specific software, like Word or how to use those. The software, uh, we build software and we formalize it. And it's sometimes easy to confuse the tools we use with the task we're trying to do. Um, 
And the issue with this, and, and, and like, why don't I just tell you what it is? It's because you ask a com every, you ask five computer scientists, you're going to get six different answers as to what computer science is. Uh, so um, I liked this from a text from the textbook of Gibbs and Tucker, which is computer science is the study of algorithms. It is the study of how do we automate and what can be automated. It is the study of problem solving. And you'll understand that in a bit more when we get into when if you make it up to 2168 and take um, and or or 2166 and start big O notation and start being able to say, oh, so do, solving this problem this way takes this long and requires this amount of resources. Um, so computer science is the study of how we automate problem solving processes. It asks what can be automated because there are things that can and can't be automated. There are things that computers can do and there's a hard line for things that computers can't do. If you're interested, look up the halting problem. That is kind of the, the thing about what computers cannot do. Um, there's this huge statement here. Theoretical computer science covers a wide variety of topics, including algorithms, data structures, computational complexity, parallel and distributed comp computation, probabilistic computation, quantum computation, automata theory, information theory, cryptography, program semantics and verification, computational biology, machine learning, computational economics, computational geometry, and computational numbers and theory and algebra. Um, that's just one field. So what do we say when we study algorithms? We study are algorithms efficient? Are computer systems able to design and execute algorithms, designing programming language and translating algorithms into those languages and identifying those important problems that we can use algorithms to solve? Um, and I keep using this magic word, algorithm. I promise I'll explain it in a bit. So what can you do with a computer science degree um, or just even a little bit of computer science? Uh, if you're in biology, if you're interested in biology, chemistry, and uh, medicine, bioinformatics, the combination of biology uh, and, and computer science applications to those. Um, in fact, it is because of bioinformatics that folding at home became the first exascale computer, which is a big milestone, meaning that we had a really big number of people work contributing uh, software to figure out uh, you know, uh, different ways to attack COVID. It's really big right now, um, biology, chemistry, and medicine, and will never not be big. Um, if you are a biologist, even learning a bit of computer science will go a long way. I'm, I'm not kidding. Same with chemistry. Uh, things like that, that's the applications, cancer detection, development of new medic medicines, HIV, development of HIV inhibitors, or the more uh, or what we classically think when we think computer science and human beings, prosthetics. In other words, you know, your, your arm, your your arms all mangled because of an accident. Let's give you a bit uh, a bigger, better robot arm to do that. Um, you know. So there are so there are a ton of things with with this, uh, physics and astronomy. Uh, tons of stuff. Um, most supernovas these days are detected by automated algorithms that are scanning the night sky. Um, physics, quantum computing, I'm no, I don't even know where to get started on that one. Um, all right, we do have a textbook here that we do use, chapter 10, and I've pretty much never read it that goes over the basics of it. Uh, but that's kind of a big area. Um, and we are at this mo a moment are grabbing huge amounts of, of um, Astro astronomical data that needs to be analyzed. Um, if you are interested in business and economics, right, using team management, building software to manage teams and help people communicate. Oh, and if you're really interested in finance and stuff, high speed algorithm uh, trading algorithms. Most of the big trading happens via algorithms these days. Okay, that's where the money is. Um, what is it? The micro crash of twenty. Micro crash of twenty twelve. I think it was the flash crash. Yeah, the twenty ten flash crash. Huge crash in the stock market, where it just happened for a short period of time. That was caused by algorithms. You're welcome. Uh, so. 
Um, psychology. If you're interested in psychology, uh, one of the that's actually where I got started in kind of research and graduate research, which was a human computer interaction. How do humans use computer? Are there better ways for humans to use computer? Um, and uh, are what are the effects, positive and negative, for using computers in certain ways? Is it more efficient to have a bigger screen? Or things like, is it more efficient to have the an ultra wide, a single ultra mi wide monitor or to have multiple monitors? Questions like that. Um, that's that's kind of the idea of psychology. Uh, what is the better way to move things around? What if the user is blind? What if they're visually impaired? How can they use that? Uh, education, any kind of education uh, thing that you learn education from. Uh, Educational re educational games and edutainment, always a hot field. Um, they're pretty awesome. And those are just if you cross with uh, with other fields, let alone the things you can do in computer science, such as you know working with software engineering, security, cryptography, data analysis, working on networks. So now let's define that magical phrase I was using a while ago. What is an algorithm? And I'm, it comes from the Latinized name, and then excuse me if I mangle this, um, Muhammad Ibn Musa al Khorizmi. I think I mangled that last one. Al Khorizmi. I'm not going to try and embarrass myself and mangle the name again. But Latinai's name is Al Ghurmiti. He was a, uh, I believe, Persian mathematician. Um, and he wrote this book, this textbook on how to do calculations. Uh, it was called The Concise Calculation Book of Calculations by Reduction. And he wrote it in 1820. Um, and it was such a pivotal uh, work that we get the entire field of algebra from the first word of the title, algebra. Uh, he wrote another book that contained formal instructions on how to do mathematical operations in this relatively new Indian system of decimal numbers. Um, that was eventually translated into Latin and that got spread throughout Europe. So that is kind of, way so because of his Big, big thing on systems, we, he, he got the name algorithm or algorithmity and the entire pro, uh, idea of algorithms is named after him. Pretty good. Uh, so um, studying algorithm, so what is an algorithm? Um, he, this is the formal definition and I promise you it's not as horrible as it seems. It's an, a, a set of well-ordered unambiguous operations which yield some result in a finite amount of time. Yeah, that's a lot to take in, I know. I, I promise I'm not going to get too theoretical like this in other ones, but I, I, I feel this is important. So studying algorithms, again, computer science kind of shot off from, uh, from mathematics. And now it's kind of like Yugoslavia. It's a bunch of countries that are, it's a bunch of fields that are all kind of conjoined together. And they all feel like they should be their own, like, uh, you know, because while they're related, they're actually all quite di different. Like, um, you know, like data science. They're, they're super similar, but they, they, they have their own thing and I's and T. So they all kind of glom together uh, because computer science is kind of a cross section of linguistics, mathematics, uh, and just general problem something. Um, so studying algorithms began in mathematics. Some algorithms you may know just from mathematics, how to do addition and multiplication by hand, right? The whole idea of adding numbers together, carrying the one to the next row, adding the, that column together, that's an algorithm. It's a bunch of operations. They are well ordered. You start at the one at the ones place, move to the tens place, then the hundreds place. They're unambiguous. It's addition. You only do the addition operation, um, and it yields some result, meaning that we're going to get an answer in a finite amount of time. It's not going to like run forever. It may take a long time, but you know there's a clear start and end. Long division, Euclid's algorithm. Um, an algorithm, and that's to find the greatest common denominator. Uh, algorithms, once we turn them into a program, an algorithm can be turned into a program using a programming language. The idea here is once you implement an algorithm in a programming language, the computer can now automate that and do it a lot quicker than we can actually do it because our brains are, are puny eight brains. And these are rocks that we, electric, that we zapped with lightning and tricked into thinking. And that makes them faster somehow. Um, so, all right, so let's go ahead and 
you know, break this down. Well-ordered. This means that one step has to follow another step. Well-ordered means that things happen in order. So an algorithm is set up well-ordered. We do these things in a specific order. Um, example, recipes, right? We, uh, we have, those are, those are very good examples of algorithms um, uh, because they are well-ordered. You have to do these steps before another. You want to put, you want to mix your ingredients when you're making chocolate chip cookies and then put the cookies in the oven. You don't want to put the cookies in the oven. You don't want to put the ingredients in the oven and then try to turn those messes into cookies. That just doesn't work. Um, we do, no, that is not a silly question. Um, you do what does best for you. I'm recording this so that you don't feel like you're missing anything in the scramble to take notes. Uh, pay, I find it easier to pay attention um, and to jot down si uh, small, simple notes. This is just kind of, I'm trying to clear up some misconceptions and some language over here um, for this one. There are a couple of, um, if, and, as, and of course the question you're thinking is, oh my God, is this going to be on the exam, on a quiz? And the answer is kind of, there is one thing. Know, know where algorithm comes from and what is it? So it's well-ordered, meaning, it meaning that we have a certain number of steps. Unambiguous operations, meaning that you can't misinterpret in uh, how much you know, uh, the, the, uh, the specific thing you're doing, right? Like, um, grab a bunch of chocolate chips is a, is a, is a ambiguous operation. Okay. Grab how many, what's a bunch and what am I grabbing with? Or whereas add, you know, a teaspoon of chocolate chips to the mix, oh, sorry, a tablespoon of chocolate chips to the, to the batter is much more unambiguous. Unambiguous operations, we can't miss, there's no misinterpretation here. It yields some result. If I follow these directions, I get cookies in a finite amount of time. I will get cookies. They will not, they will, it will not take forever for me to get cookies. It may feel like forever to get cookies, but it will not take forever. Um, all right. So there are fundamental insights as to computer, uh, computer science. Uh, these are kind of the, na uh, the names here. For more information, visit this website. Does it still exist? What is computation? Hey, that's pretty complex. OK, so a couple of names, Bacon, Leibniz, Boole's, Turing, Shannon's, and Morse's insight. They all kind of had in independent realizations that all information in computers can be, uh, and you'll get understand this more as we get into hardware, can be resolved as zeros and ones. You can use zeros and ones uh, to represent any two distinguishable states, like high and low, or on and off. We'll talk about this more in coming lectures. Um, and Turing's big insight, Alan Turing, his big insight is that basically all algorithms, if we can do that, all algorithms can be re re reduced into five kind of actions, moving left, moving right. Uh, so say you've got this extremely long strip of paper that's divided into squares. He used the idea of ticker tape. You can move left along the square, right along the square, along, along the squares. You can put a zero or a one or erase it. If that doesn't really make sense, uh, don't worry. That gets covered in automata. It took like a while for that to kind of make sense to me. But basically, the idea here is that everything we are doing with in computers these days comes down to ones and zeros at the uh, at the hardware level, and the computer is extremely fast at what it at what it does, and it translates all this high level stuff into a bunch of ones and zeros. Everything you do, from the little tiny lights in each individual pixel emits, is encoded, you know, to these letters, to the files, to the video stream I'm doing, is a bunch of ones and zeros, being shot at ludicrous speeds and interpreted at ludic ludicrous speeds by your computer. It is obscene how fast computers are these days. Um, so a bit of history. Let's talk about, so I mentioned there's history to computer science. So let me kind of talk about a brief history of computer science. Uh, the first kind of thing, you, the first kind of thing we, we bring up is the first tool, um, mathematical tool, which is the abacus. It was not a computer. Um, it turned humans into computers. In fact, computer used to be a job for humans. Um, that meant that you did computations, you did operations. Um, 
but back but in the 16 between 1600 and 1800 the idea of gear machines started up um and i go into a bit of detail about this or sorry i i i i will talk about this a bit now but honestly if you want to know more about early history of computer science i highly recommend watching this vi this video series over here as well as checking out this small comic about Ada Lovelace um, and Charles Babbage, um, which I linked to on on um, on module uh, module one. Okay. okay. Uh, the idea here is that uh, fairy scientists, engineers, uh, very little distinction these day, uh, in those early days like Pascal, Leibniz, and Babbage, they all wanted to create these machines that could do computations automatically. And they figured, oh, if the gear is in this position, that means this number. If it's in this position, that means that number. And the idea Babbage had was, hey, let's create a gear-based machine which can print out, uh, and it does computations, and then it'll print the output on paper. So that brings us to the first programmer, Ada Lovelace. Uh, she is classically considered the uh, first pro uh, programmer. A uh, Augusta Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, the first programmer. Uh, for those of you coming from an English background, who is Ada Lovelace's father? Lord Byron? Byron. Byron, creator of the Byronic hero. Byron um, was infamous. He was a celebrity in those days. Uh, and his and his divorce with Ada Lovelace's mother was so notorious that people were firing shots about it long after uh, the, the people involved were long dead. Um, it is, uh, he, he was a poet and he had an extremely uh, active lifestyle. It was, it, he was a character. Um, and as a result, uh, the young uh, Ada, she got, pushed into um into do in pursuing mathematics so let's see so what we're doing here is that um so what she did is that she uh, learned about babbage's analytical engine it was designed but she was never produced and what happened and what made her the first programmer uh, was the is that she took uh, is that she published a paper specifically she translated a paper and then she published a bunch of notes which are longer than a paper. Um, part of the reason I linked to that comic was it had a bunch of links to that original stuff right over here. Um, so here is the uh, this is her original this is the original paper just put onto here and this is what she's translated. And I'm just scrolling down. This was all translated. And then at this point, where notes that were nowhere near the bottom is where the notes start coming in. Her stuff. Um, above a part of which was the were ways of comp compute, were ways to use this theoretical, completely uncreated gear machine of how to compute Bernoulli numbers. She also wrote about how such a machine could be used to do something and work on operations other than numbers, which is about 100 years ahead of its time. The next big step in the history of computer science came around World War II, which is the birth of modern cryptography. Um, that was, and that was using machines to break uh, German ciphers during World War II. Um, that effort was called ULTRA, there was also an effort to break the Japanese ciphers, which was called magic. If you had clearance to both, you had ultra magic clearance. Um, Alan Turing uh, worked uh, was one of the was one of many people uh, who worked on this effort. Uh, his role was instrumental. Um, but if you've seen the imitation game, I, I would like to let you know that uh, he had a much happier life. Uh, and was less, much less cantankerous than uh, Benedict Cumberbatch played him as, uh, you know, dramatization for his for the purpose of uh, of drama. But a lot of the facts were pretty good there. Um, 
So he was he's uh, considered to be the father of computer science due to his uh, due to the Church Turing thesis, which basically formally proved kind of using mathematics. What is it that computers can do right when you get down to it, um, which was different than cryptography. There's also the Turing test, which is kind of the idea of uh, can we tell whether the, the thing I'm communicating with is a human or a robot? Um, anyway, but the idea of automatically, uh, you know, breaking these ciphers was, was instrumental to an allied victory in World War II, uh, to the point that uh, Eisenhower said that it reduced it by about two, the war in Europe by about two years. It, it is extremely, uh, it is extremely impressive. And uh, now this is a common problem for anyone taking a security class to break, uh, to break the Enigma cipher. <laughs> I've done it. So it's part of what you do in, cl in class because computers are that fast these days. Um, Alan Turing, however, uh, was essentially um, was persecuted because he was gay. Um, he was given the choice uh, once uh, his his uh, sexual orientation was made light. He was he was uh, cr it was criminal. It was a criminal thing at the time, and he was uh, given the choice between chemical castration or imprisonment. He chose the latter, sorry, he chose the former, and eventually committed suicide, um, which, and he did so at a young, at a fairly young age, which robbed computer science of one of its greatest brains at, at a very inopportune time. Another, it's similar with Ada Lovelace. She died, I believe, of cancer. Again, very young. So, um, there. So, yeah, not great. The um, British government eventually did apologize for that, um, but that like happened a couple of years ago. To give you kind of perspective on that. Um, moving on, because that was super depressing. Uh, first computer. There are no, that's contentious. There is no clear first computer. Um, a lot of people will say that they're the first because of X, Y, Z. Uh, one famous early computer is the ENIAC, which is the ele Electrical Numerical Integrator and Computer. Pretty big. Um, and that was done by rewiring stuff, um, which is pretty cool. It was began construction began in 1943, constructed in 1946. You used a bunch of vacuum tubes. It was 1,800 square feet. It was big. Primarily, it was used for artillery calculations. And since then, the stories of computer has been continual, continual shrinking. The I IBM produced its first P uh, com uh, personal computer. That's what PC is, personal computer, because you could have it at home rather than needing an entire floor of your building dedicated to the computer. It was released in 1983. The internet really is where things took off and that's when computers began to become commonplace in people's homes. Um, growing up, um, when I was in elementary school, it was pretty common for people not to have computers at home. Um, and once the internet happened around 2000, that's where it started real, around the 2000s was where it started to, uh, really pick up in people's homes. But I remember, I think it was maybe 96 that I had internet access, very basic internet access. So um, that is fairly recent. The, um, the internet is basically just a giant net public network of computers. Um, So, and one of the, and the biggest application that runs on it is the World Wide Web, which is what we use this for, um, where basically you go to an address on a web and, it, and the, you go to another computer, ask for a file called a web page, and it gives it to you, and your computer takes this code and renders it into another page, like this one. This is just a, a bunch of files from another computer that are with instructions on how to show them to me. Um, the web is so large that we require that one of the biggest companies in the world, Alphabet, has a tool, Google, used to be called Google, now it's called Alphabet, 
uh, that it requires a search engine to find all the content on it effectively. That is how big the internet is. Uh, the other big, uh, big thing in computation is uh, these computers, smartphones, amazingly powerful uh, devices, which these days can be used for anything from uh, gaming, watching videos. Um, you could even work on these things, though I don't know why you would. Um, so the big things of this century have of this century so far have been miniaturization, getting these things smaller, and uh, scale, how to handle more of them. So it is three fifteen. So a couple words for you on how to get how to succeed in this class. Uh, how do you become a good programmer? Practice. Um, and, and understanding the mindset of what makes a good programmer a good programmer, which is that humans are intrinsically lazy and you're becoming a programmer and doing all this hard work so you can become lazy. I know that sounds really counterintuitive, but the idea here is I rather spend, I'd rather spend an hour on a ta uh, automating a task that takes me a half an hour to do. So when I have to, so the next couple of times I have to do it, all I have to do is run that program and boom, it's done. I don't have to think about it anymore. Okay, that's that's what I mean about being doing more work so you can be lazy. Um, and that's what I also mean by they're lazy in an extremely smart and specialized way. So the and but how do you get good? Practice, really. I mean it. Um, doing these pro doing the problems in the textbook, that's the way you get uh, get good at it. Um, now, with regards to uh, what you're going to be doing in your lab, to find it, you're going to see we'll have lab one over here. Um, it's a simple PDF that explains it. Um, and the idea here is you'll print out the biography of a program of, of a famous computer scientist whose name is not Turing, Gates, or Jobs, because they are, if I didn't put that in, everybody would be saying Turing, Gates, or Jobs. I'd be happy if everybody did Grace Hopper but not if everybody did uh, turn gates or jobs. Um, now, this will require you to install Python on your computer. Um, that is, it, I have a bunch of videos over here, installing Python. So um, that is gonna be covered by your TAs in your first lab, but I have this here if you wanna try, to, uh, try it yourself and go ahead. Um, this first video over here, is for if you're running on a piece on your standard run of the mill uh, Windows PC, or if you're installing it working on um, a Mac. If you're running Linux, like I have done many a times, uh, then I assume you know what you're doing, and it will. And Python three should automatically come installed. Just be sure to run Python three as opposed to Python. Um, uh, it may it may be aliased correctly in the latest versions of Ubuntu. If you Completely misunderstood what any of that was. Don't worry about that. Yes, Adam. Hi. Um, I already downloaded Python. I think it's it's in an application called PyCharm. Sorry, uh, it's in an application called PyCharm. Is that okay, or do I still have uh, to yes. use this version? Um, it's okay. It's good to have Python generally installed on your on your computer system wide. Um, it's but, like a or, Python three though. Right, right, right. It is like Python three. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think PyCharm like basically localizes it so only PyCharm can, it, so it's a Python, I, I may be wrong, but I think Python, mm -hmm. the way PyCharm works is that it, it has its own copy of Python that it only, that it only it knows about. And it keeps it isolated from all the other uh, Pythons in your system if you have installed Python. Okay, yeah, I don't that's have anything like, else. Again, if that sounds ultra, uh, super complex, don't worry about it. That's for people, that kind of stuff only matters for other, situations where programmers have a lot of different projects on their system. I, I know you wanted the IDLE. I'm pretty idle. sure it has it. Don't so idle oh. comes pre-installed with this. Um okay. so there's so you you're all right let me lower your hand uh or you can oh, go oh yeah, yeah I'll I'll do that sorry and let me get explain so to program you need two to, to program in Python you need two tools you need an interpreter e.g you need the Python pro the 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 program that lets you or your computer turn the coding language into instructions for your computer, and you need an editor of some kind, something to write your code in. This, in following these directions will give you both. 
Um, I will be using the editor called idle because it comes pre-installed if with uh, this package of Python you just you download from the python.org website. So following this direction will give you everything you need. If you want to use a different program like Visual Studio Code or PyCharm or Emacs or Vim or or uh, or Atom, go for it. I don't care what you use. I will be using idle because that is the one that requires the least effort for people to get. Now, finally, if your computer is like a Chromebook or an iPad, or you are otherwise limited and your computer is super slow and all you can do is open a web page, watch this video because there are options available for you. And if you are having trouble, send me an email, right? If you're unable to get it by, set up by yourself, you know, in the next couple of days, send me an email or schedule office hours because you got to get it working. So, and I will sit down with you and make sure that it, you get it working. Make sense to everybody? Now, fortunately for our next class where we're actually gonna do work, um, you don't need to have it installed on your computer because guess what? Your computer, the, the textbook runs it automatically. Make sense? All right. Okay, so I will see everybody uh, on Thursday. If you have questions for me, I will stay behind because it's not like I have a train to catch or anything. So if you have questions, just let me know. Uh, will the two weeks of online learning affect how we demo our projects? Uh, only in the sense that, by the way, class is dismissed if you wanna leave. Um, it will only affect it in the sense that we'll be do meeting online, that's it. So we'll be doing it over Zoom. Um, so we don't need to download Python by Thursday? Um, it would be good if you did, just simply so, so that you could get started on your lab on Friday, but you don't need to. If you don't install it by Friday, that's fine. The TA will go over in lab how to do it. You should be able to install Python and do the first lab all in the two hours of the, of the lab period. Okay, thank you. So to answer that question, to turn in a lab, what you do is that's two steps. You turn it into Canvas and then you show it to the TA. And the reason is, is that sometimes the, sometimes they're, the internet connection is finicky. And when we put in your grade, it, it doesn't update. And you're like, hey, where's my grade? I, I demoed it. And we're like, oh, right, I remember that. And I see when you submitted it and your code's there in case you know, you accident, it accidentally got deleted. So that's why you wanna up, make a habit of uploading your code. Because uh, that's why we want you to upload your code because things happen. I completed lab one. Awesome. Um, and I was told that I should just wait for the next lab day. Is that just Monday? Um, it would be, mon for you, it would be Monday, but it's not next Monday because next Monday's off. So if you want, I can wait, I can wait a bit at, we can wait a bit after class and I can, and you can show it to me and we can clear it up now. Okay. Thank you. 